This video is the third instalment in a three-part mini-series on the role of women in the New Testament. So far, we've discussed the role of women in the early church, how this role was suppressed by sexist movements within the church, even to the degree of trying to change the text of scripture itself, and how Jesus' teachings and behaviours challenged the gender hierarchies of the time to present a deeply egalitarian substance. However, there is one source above all that most modern Christian misogynists appeal to in an attempt to give divine precedence to their bigotry, and that is the letters of Paul. There are four passages, in particular, which are often brought up to justify a sexist reading of the Pauline epistles. 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 to 16, Ephesians 5 verses 22 to 24, and the apparently similar teachings in both 1 Corinthians 14 34 to 35 and 1 Timothy 2 verse 12. While there are other passages which could be given a sexist reading, most of the explanation for those passages follows similar reasoning to the explanation for these, and so I'll only address these four verses in our present discussion as a kind of prototype for how to think about these sorts of passages. Before even approaching Paul's teachings on gender, there are two important things to remember. Firstly, we should remember that it was Paul who gave the teaching in Galatians 3.28 that there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Thus, Paul explicitly decries drawing any distinction between male and female in matters of the church and the community of Christ. For this reason, any time when he seems to depart from these teachings should be approached with particular caution. Secondly, we should remember the warning in 2 Peter chapter 3 regarding the words of Paul, that there are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. Paul is specifically singled out as being written in complex, difficult to understand ways, and so if we find that a simple reading of Paul seems to contradict what is established elsewhere in the scripture, we should seek a deeper, more nuanced reading which, given this warning in Peter, is likely to be closer to Paul's intention. I would also like to remind you that throughout this series, I'll be assuming the gender theology laid out in my Transformed video. Anyway, without further ado, let's begin. Let's begin with the easiest of the verses, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 to 16, in which Paul commands women to wear head coverings in church, and men not to. Now, I've always advocated on this channel an approach to biblical exegesis that begins with a proper contextualization in the culture of the original audience of the text. Extensive contemporary sources reveal that it was customary for women in first century Greco-Roman provinces to wear a head covering and veil whenever outside the home. To take just a handful of examples, Valerius Maximus describes how Sulpicius Gallus, consul in 166 BC, divorced his wife for appearing uncovered in public. Plutarch maintains that it is more usual for women to go forth in public with their heads covered, and Dio Chrysostom writes that the convention regarding feminine attire includes that they have their faces covered as they walk. Pliny, Clement, and others also confirm this practice. For a woman to appear in public without face covering was considered deeply shameful. It was seen as a symbol of masculinity by Lucian and Apelius, as a symbol of lesbianism by Lucian elsewhere, as a symbol of adultery by Dio Chrysostom, and as a symbol of prostitution by both Dio Chrysostom and Philo. Similarly, our contemporary sources show that in the wider Greco-Roman culture, during religious practices, men, particularly those playing a central role in the practice, were expected to wear head coverings as a sign of devotion and piety, as well as often serving as a general status symbol. Confirmed by the writings of Dionysus of Halicarnassus, who stated that the head coverings for men was the custom on the occasion of every prayer, and also supported by the archaeological evidence. Whether women were also required to wear head coverings in specifically religious contexts seems more ambiguous, with at least Plutarch decrying the fact that they did not. 
once we understand this cultural miasma in the background, Paul's instructions start to make a lot less sense and sound at least a bit less sexist. On the one hand, it seems that the Corinthian community had a number of men who were adopting the pagan practices of covering their heads, which, as symbols of status, introduced social inequalities into the familial bonds of the church and also risked appearing to one of the pagan gods. On the other hand, it seems that some of the women in the Corinthian church were foregoing head coverings, either in response to the men's practice of removing head coverings or due to the familial nature of the Christian community. As they were all Adelphoi in Christ, the women may have seen it as appropriate to dress as if amongst family, i.e. without a head covering. However, these two together seem to have been creating a bit of a problem for the Corinthian community. In the case of the men, by introducing symbols of status and symbols of honouring pagan gods, the men subvert the equality of the community in Christ, and so in the eyes of Paul, they risk dishonouring Christ himself by undermining that equality. In the case of women, as non-Christians may be attending the church meetings, Paul clearly believed it should be seen as a public place, and so by dressing appropriately for a private setting, the women risk shaming the whole community, and particularly their husbands, in the eyes of the onlookers. In this way, we see that Paul's concern here is not with the relations between men and women, or with a universal right moral order in how to worship, but with how the behaviours of the men and women in the Corinthian church specifically might bring shame upon the community in the eyes of outsiders. This concern for the appearance of the church before non-Christians was clearly a major concern for the leaders of the early church. We see similar themes in Paul's discussion of food offerings to idols in 1 Corinthians 8, and in 1 and 2 Peter, for example, in 1 Peter 2.12, which instructs believers to conduct yourselves honourably among the Gentiles so that they may see your honourable deeds and glorify God, and 2 Peter 2.2, which warns that by those who follow their licentious ways, the way of truth will be maligned. Thus, although our present English translations of 1 Corinthians 11 suggest a very sexist instruction, setting up a kind of hierarchy between men and women, it seems that the original intention was not a universal moral law, but merely a warning about behaving in an inappropriate way before those who were not members of the church. This was explained to me very well by the Reverend Mike Pilavacci, although he's certainly a lot more conservative than I, even he could see that this verse is cultural when he pointed out that while there's nothing in the Bible to forbid Christians showing up to church in bikinis and speedos, we don't do that, because if we did, someone who was not Christian and joined the community, that stranger would get a very wrong idea about what Christians were all about. Likewise, the overwhelming historical evidence suggests that Paul's advice on head coverings is not intended as a universal law, but merely as guidance to avoid giving the wrong impression to strangers who joined the church community. Let us now turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and the famous or infamous Wives Submit to Your Husband's Passage. Thankfully, we don't need to do as much cultural background to understand this passage because the egalitarian explanation arises by just actually reading the verse that immediately precedes it. For if we begin at verse 21, we read, Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands. Here, it's clear that Paul is effectively repeating the exact same teaching. All Christians are to be subject to one another, and as a part of that, and in the exact same way, and to the same degree, wives are also subject to their husbands, and husbands to their wives. Why does Paul choose to highlight wives in particular? There appear to be two reasons, one which we discern from the background culture, and one from the text itself. Regarding the cultural reasons, under Roman law, women were considered property. First property of their fathers, then, once married, property of their husbands, and therefore they were not considered to be free agents under the law. Thus, Paul's Hellenic audience would not have considered it necessary to instruct women to obey their husbands. They were seen as property, not agents, so of course they obeyed. Paul's teaching directly challenges this conception by explicitly including wives in his command that all believers should submit to one another. Paul demonstrates that wives in the church are not property but should be considered free agents in their own right, and he's appealing to them as free agents to engage in the self-sacrificial love practiced by all members of the church. The second reason, which appears in the text itself, relates to the following verses regarding headship. Now, we've seen in 1 Corinthians 11 already that Paul has a tendency of appealing to these notions of headship when dealing with matters of honour and shame, 
The men of Corinth were dishonouring Christ, and so Christ is the head they dishonour, while the women were dishonouring the whole community, and particularly their husbands, by dressing for private life in public, and so the husband is their head which is dishonoured. It's not an authority thing, it's a who are you bringing shame on by your behaviour thing. Here again, it seems the language of heads is used to talk about honour and shame. Paul, in his slightly paternalistic way, seems to be warning the women he is referred to with free agency not to use that agency in a way that shames and dishonours their husbands, which would have been seen as contrary to the mutual love the Christian community was meant to show for one another. It's also important to recognise that in the following verses, Paul explicitly dispels any illusion that his commandment to wives to submit to their husbands was in any way intended to establish a hierarchy in the relationships. By commanding husbands to love their wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, Ephesians 5.25. This is clearly an appeal to Christ as a model of service and self-sacrifice. Paul says this precisely to cut off any false interpretations of the preceding verses as saying that women should especially submit to their husbands, beyond his general instruction for all Christians to submit to one another, by saying that husbands should serve their wives and give themselves up for their wives, even as Christ served and gave himself up. This is a direct appeal to Christ's teaching about him coming not to rule over, but to serve. In many ways, this is also the higher bar. Paul reasserts that everyone in the Christian community is meant to submit to one another, and the instruction to women is only intended to assert their status as free agents before the church. That is the clear intention of this passage. Lastly, we turn to the apparently similar teaching we find in both 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2. In 1 Corinthians 14.34 we read, Women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. And in 1 Timothy 2.12 we read, I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. These verses are often taken as the strongest evidence in favour of those who oppose women in leadership in the church. However, it should be immediately clear from the preceding discussion of this entire series that a surface reading would have Paul contradicting himself here. For here, Paul seems to insist that women cannot be leaders in the church, but in Romans 16, 7, Paul explicitly lists Junia as prominent among the apostles. If Junia was an apostle, then she certainly was not silent in the church. She certainly spoke, and she certainly held authority over the men in the church she visited, at least as far as the apostles held authority. Similarly, Romans 16.1 lists Phoebe as a deacon of the church at Kenkrea, sorry for the pronunciation, and in 1 Corinthians 11.5, Paul indicates that women were praying and prophesying, and he doesn't rebuke them for this, suggesting that 1 Corinthians 14 cannot have been intended as a general instruction for women to remain silent. Given the utter implausibility of such a surface reading, we must turn to a more careful analysis of each passage, and in a way that will surprise absolutely no one who watched my homophobia video, we find that these two passages seem to be totally different topics, falling in line with the tendency of conservative theology to lump together passages about completely separate topics due to mere similarity of a surface reading of the English translation, and then use these passages to reach conservative conclusions. In this case, the Timothy passage seems to be an explicit rebuke to a kind of Gnostic heresy which was developing in the church of Ephesus, a heresy which particularly focused on veneration of Eve as almost a mother goddess who created Adam herself, in direct contradiction to the Jewish scriptures. In the first century, women would, on average, be less educated and less literate than men, meaning they were less able to read the original scriptures and were therefore more susceptible to these kinds of Gnostic teachings. Once we understand this, Paul's purpose in 1 Timothy 2 becomes quite transparent. Paul's concern with this heresy is clearly indicated by his focus on the relations between Adam and Eve, and his warning against women teaching seems to be a direct response to the spread of this heresy. In short, the message is a rebuke directed towards the leaders of the church for allowing those who were not instructed in the Old Testament and who believed Gnostic heresies to preach in the church. In other words, it was a response to a very particular crisis in a specific church not a general instruction, which is why Paul can affirm Priscilla as an apostle without contradicting himself. Turning now to the Corinthian passage, 
we see this is another case where something funny is going on in the manuscript record. Verses 34 to 35 appear before verse 36 in most manuscripts, but are moved to after verse 40 in the manuscripts known as DG in 88. Some commentators, such as Barbara Leonard and Jerome Murphy O'Connor, have taken this displacement as evidence that these passages are not even original Pauline teachings, but are a later interpolation introduced into the manuscript by later, more intentionally sexist Christian scholars, similar to the other intentional modifications to the manuscripts discussed above. However, a bit of jiggery-pokery in verse order is not that rare, and I'm actually personally more convinced in this way by arguments put forward by David Odell Scott, which points out that in the majority of manuscripts, these two verses are immediately followed by an incredulous, double, negative rhetorical question. Or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones it was reached? Odell Scott proposes that verses 34-35 to were a common Corinthian saying which Paul was responding to. The incredulous double rhetorical question was intended to show just how absurd the preceding proposition was. The explanation for the variation in the manuscript is simply that later scribes moved these verses away from the incredulous challenge to the verses, and closer to Paul's teaching about order in worship, in order to undermine this original contradiction that existed in the text. In other words, it was so obvious to these scribes that Paul was contradicting verses 34-35 to that they tried to modify the manuscript itself so that the readers would see these passages as Pauline instructions rather than as a saying that he was rejecting. Thus, we see that rather than representing a repetition of the same core teaching, these two verses in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 represent two unrelated instructions to two churches facing very different problems. To the Corinthians, Paul is rebuking them for having a saying that women should remain silent in church, insisting they should instead look to the practices of the other churches rather than their own sayings, the practices which brought us the likes of Priscilla. And in Timothy, Paul is rebuking the leadership of the Ephesian church for allowing those who believed in Gnostic heresies to preach before the church as a whole rather than sticking to the orthodoxy that he had laid down. In conclusion then, we see that not only does Jesus demonstrate an egalitarian view of women, but further, all of the passages in Paul which have been used to argue against egalitarian Christianity are based on misinterpretation and ignoring cultural context and nuance. That is, however, really for the best, because if these passages really read in the way that conservatives read them, then Paul would be deeply, deeply self-contradictory which would definitely have a very troubling implication for theology in general. Altogether, I hope this discussion has helped reaffirm the most important principle of biblical exegesis. The Bible is complicated! Especially when it comes to interpreting the Pauline epistles, which literally verses in the Bible tell us are so complicated they're easy to get wrong. When we approach these texts, we must always be aware of the original audience of these texts and the many cultural nuances which the writers were drawing on to convey their meaning, and how these cultural nuances have probably been lost over the years. This concludes this series on women in the New Testament. I might continue this into a longer series on gender, um, probably with a bit of a break to do some actual economic stuff in the middle, uh, but if there are other topics that people would like me to cover, I I'm always happy to look into something. I can't guarantee a video, because if the topic turns out to just be really dull, I probably will not have the energy to deal with that, because this is a hobby for now. But I am always happy to hear your recommendations, and will look into them at least. I hope this video, this series, has been helpful. Until next time, grace and peace.